Hello. In today's lecture, we'll discuss economic and social rights. We'll begin by asking what this category of rights actually is, which rights it contains, and to give some examples. We'll then turn to another international treaty, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and we'll conclude with a discussion of comparisons and contrasts between economic and social rights, or ESRs, and civil and political rights. Let's begin with asking the first basic question. What are ESRs? Well, they are rights that guarantee the conditions under which everyone is able to meet his or her basic needs relating to such necessities as uh, workplace health, social security, housing, food, water, health care, education, and so forth. A prominent reference to economic and social rights was in President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Four Freedoms Address to the U.S. Congress during World War II. As part of a discussion of fundamental freedoms that should be available to all individuals in all societies, Roosevelt referred to freedom from want, which he defined as economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants. Although President Roosevelt did not define the content of economic and social rights, international instruments subsequent to his address have done so. And from those instruments, we can deduce some examples of economic and social rights. First, the right to education, which provides basic instruction and schooling, which is geared toward developing the human personality and encouraging effective participation in society. The right to food, which includes most principally freedom from hunger and access to safe and nutritional food. The right to health, which includes access to physical and mental health care services, facilities, and to protection against epidemic diseases. The right to housing, basic shelter. The right to social security. Then the right to work in safe working conditions with fair wages that provide a decent living for the worker and his or her family. As these examples suggest, economic and social rights are primarily positive obligations. That is, states have to adopt some affirmative measure to secure these rights. So for example, uh, the obligation to provide free primary education to all children requires states to ensure that children have access to schools, teachers, learning materials, etc. Now, the state can do this in a number of ways. It can provide such education and such materials itself, or it can facilitate private systems of education. Now, some economic and social rights involve uh, negative liberties. So here's an example. Imagine a stream running through a rural community that provides its residents with clean and safe water, both for drinking and for farming purposes. The state must not interfere with a resident's access to the stream. So in this instance, the state satisfies the obligation with respect to the right to water by refraining from action. Let's turn now to a discussion of which legal instruments protect ESRs. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights that we've previously studied certainly does, uh, as do various UN human rights treaties such as the ICESCR which we'll talk about more in a moment, regional human rights treaties, and also many national constitutions. It's fair to say that the leading international instrument on ESRs is the Covenant, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, or ICESCR. Here are some basic facts about the Covenant. It was opened for signature in 1966 and entered into force in 1976. These are the same dates, by the way, as we've previously studied for the ICCPR. And as of January of 2014, the ICESCR had 161 states parties. What I'd like to do now, however, is to compare two provisions in the ICCPR, that is the Civil and Political Rights Covenant, with uh, the same equivalent provision in the ICESCR, and that is Article 2 of both of these treaties. And I, I want to highlight for you some of the differences 
which will set the stage for a discussion of some of the challenges that have been faced with regard to economic and social rights. So here you see before you uh, Article 2 of the ICCPR. This is the foundational or framework uh, provision which describes state parties' obligations. So you see here the obligation to respect and ensure to all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction the rights recognized in this particular treaty without distinction or discrimination. Now, how is that uh, respect and insurance to be done? Well, uh, it the Article 2 also provides that uh, if a person's rights are violated, they have a right to an effective and enforceable remedy, which can be uh, determined either by judicial, administrative, or legislative means. And I want to focus for the moment on judicial means. It's contemplated by Article 2 of the ICCPR that there would be some sort of uh, judicial remedy provided in many instances. Recall, too, that uh, the ICCPR and civil and political rights in general are negative liberties, and you see that in the reference to the word respect, meaning to refrain from interfering uh, with economic and, uh, excuse me, with uh, civil and political rights. Now let's compare this clause to Article 2 of the ICESCR, and here I've given you the entire clause uh, written out, and I want to focus on a, a number of different provisions. First, the obligation that states parties undertake is to take steps both individually and with the assistance of uh, uh, other governments uh, to the maximum extent of its available resources with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of economic and social rights by all appropriate means including specifically legislative measures. Now you'll see there's no mention of judicial measures or administrative measures, nor is there any mention of remedies. There is, however, a parallel obligation not to discriminate uh, with regard to the exercise of ESRs. From this text in Article 2, we can e extract four distinctive features uh, of ESRs in the covenant. Progressive realization, uh, that is to say rights are given effect in stages and over time. Maximum available resources as a constraint or limitation on the realization of ESRs. A focus on legislative measures as the primary means to give effect to or realize ESRs. And an obligation uh, of richer nations to assist financially and technically poorer nations in achieving ESRs. Now, from these four distinctive features, I want to conclude the lecture with a question for each of you to think about before you watch the next lecture, and that is, what challenges might arise as a result of these four distinctive features of ESRs? Progressive realization, maximum available resources, legislative measures, and international assistance. We'll discuss the answers to that question in the following lecture. For now, I invite you to uh, look at the PDF files on the course webpage, where I have provided some uh, links to additional sources for information on ESRs.